how can I say thanks? You realize, we realize, we can't give what we don't have. God's Spirit continues for yet a season to contend with His people, to call us out, to wake us up, that we would turn away from the noise, the din of this world, and increasingly hear the promptings of His Spirit We celebrate this season, Thanksgiving. Just what does it mean to be thankful? We can give definitions, and I will, but it goes so much more deeper in the spiritual realm. Being thankful is to be conscious of a benefit received as in our prayers for what we are about to receive, Lord, make us truly thankful. To be expressive of thanks. Thank you, God, for another day of life. Or to be well pleased with a gladness of heart. So we ask, as we reflect back on the year nearly spent, do we have things to be thankful for? And more importantly, that this attitude of gratitude would be revealed in our lives, in our deportment, in our fellowship. Would you bow your heads with me? Our Father in heaven, we come into your presence. And Lord, we are undone. We are not yet what we should be. But we praise you, God, for all potential is available to us by the power of your indwelling Holy Spirit. Come, Father, attend us this day. Reach down, touch. May each one feel the impress of your spirit, dear God, at the point of need. Raise us up into your throne room where we may spend these brief moments. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. I'm ordinarily, it's been some time since I've been on this end of things, and ordinarily things would be a little more involved, but we're not going to do that today. 
Would you please open your Bibles with me to the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 16. Colossians, chapter 3, and verse 16. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, through hymns, through songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. The teaching part of this text we find acceptable enough. However, admonish. Perhaps it might get a little uncomfortable for some. Of course, we realize this means to warn, to reprimand, to advise or urge firmly or earnestly. Admonishment is to engender accountability. Nothing wrong with accountability. As we first and foremost are accountable to the Lord. The text clearly lays out that as we are called out what we are called and desire to accomplish here from week to week. Our response, hopefully, is one of gratitude or thankfulness. Turn with me now, please, to the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Romans, chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. And what is that wrath, people? God abhors sin, the very thing that separated us from Him in the beginning, and that tore apart the unity that was once known in heaven. This is just one text to describe the heart of what we have to be thankful for. How could a heart that is earnestly seeking not respond with thanks to such a gift as this? Life experience reveals in time that as much as, as thankfulness is a response, it's also a choice. The decisions we are confronted with often harbor obstacles, both great and small. Despite these obstacles, we are exhorted in the book 1 Timothy, or excuse me, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 18 where Paul encourages us, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, recognizing God permits trials to strengthen our faith. For many, however, the human condition all too easily works itself in, in an attempt at some pull yourself up by the bootstraps intellectual ascent. We are reminded that the greatest deception of the human mind in, in Christ's day was that a mere assent, this would be an acceptance or an agreement to the truth, constitutes righteousness. In all human experience, a theoretical knowledge of the truth has been proved to be insufficient for the saving of the soul. It does not bring forth the fruits of righteousness. A jealous regard for what is termed theological truth often accompanies a hatred of genuine truth as made manifest in life. The darkest chapters of history are replete with records of crimes committed by bigoted religionists. 
The Pharisees themselves claimed to be children of Abraham and boasted of their possessions of the oracles of God. Yet these advantages did not preserve them from their selfishness. The malignity, their intent to do harm, greed for gain, the basest hypocrisy. They thought themselves the greatest religionists of the world, but their so-called orthodoxy led them to crucify their Lord. The same danger exists for us here today. Many take for granted that they're Christians simply because they subscribe to certain theological tenets. But they've not brought the truth into practical life. They've not believed and loved it. Therefore, they've not received the power and grace that come through sanctification of in the truth. We may profess faith in the truth, but if it does not make us sincere, if it does not make us kind, if it does not make us patient, if it does not make us forbearing, heavenly minded, it is a curse to its possessors. And through our influence, it becomes a curse to the world. The righteousness which Christ taught is conformity of the heart and life to the revealed will of God. Sinful men can become righteous only as they have faith in God and maintain a vital connection with Him. Then, true godliness will elevate the thoughts and ennoble the life. Then external forms of religion accord with the internal purity, then the ceremonies required of the service of God are not just meaningless rites like those of the hypocritical Pharisees. It does not take us long in this experience we call life to realize that we are independently powerless to overcome sin, which is pernicious, destructive, which is selfish at its core. It has been said that once you remove the I from sin, it's no longer sin. Isn't this true? Both literally and figuratively. So it was before the fall with Lucifer, whose name, very name, representative of his original and perfectly created image, his character, in the beginning, meant light bearer, shining one, the morning star, until sin was found in him. The name Satan, as we know, no, has come to mean adversary, one who withstands or stands against another. It is difficult to comprehend how being made so perfect could allow himself to be drawn into such a state. But such is the malignity of sin. Be forewarned. If the spotlight that is on you is greater than the light of Christ that is within you, that spotlight will destroy you. Human nature leads many to seek to surround themselves with those like themselves. It's natural. However, frequently, all too frequently, and some, for many, some vain attempt to validate their own insecurities. Society today is increasingly polarized. It's not difficult to see. 
And while many embrace the so-called social media, which generally only works to fuel the polarity, here all too many search for some sense of belonging and personal validation to be relevant or to be liked. Sadly, there are those who become victims allowing the opinions or dislikes of others to so discolor their self-perspective to the point where some have even been willing to take their own lives. God is calling out to each receptive soul. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, for he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Isaiah chapter 55, 6 through 9. What God desires from all His creatures is the service of love. This homage that springs from an intelligent appreciation of His, his character. He takes no pleasure in forced acceptance, in forced allegiance, and to all He grants freedom of will that they may render Him voluntary service. That comes actually from Great Controversy, pages 492 and 493. Please turn with me to 2 Corinthians, if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. We then, as workers together with Him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For He says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Time is one of the most precious commodities of this day, our day. The nature, frequency, and intensity of events coming upon this world increasingly reveal what should be stark signs to us, clear warnings that time is very short. For those who have been given greater light, that's us. Time is even much shorter as judgment will begin with the house of the Lord. There is no time to waste, people. Please turn with me one more time to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 in verse 11. <clears throat> and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now our salvation is nearer than we first than when we first believed. The spirit of prophecy reveals in the Review and Herald, December 11th, 1888, the Sunday movement is now waking, making its way in darkness. This was then. The leaders are concealing the true issues, and many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whether the undercurrent is tending. They are working in blindness. 
They do not see that if a Protestant government sacrifices the principles that have made them a free, independent nation and through legislation bring into constitutional principles that which will propagate, yes, papal falsehood and papal delusion, they are plunging into the, into the horrors of the Dark Ages. There was a movement in, in Mrs. White's day. People I trust, many, hopefully most if not all of you are aware that movement has been relived and is taking place and is already well underway. Since 2015, there has been a quickening pace of events surrounding what will all too soon culminate in the healing of the deadly wound with Sunday legislation to follow. The speed and stealth by which these are coming into play help us to begin to see more clearly just how it is possible that all ten virgins of Matthew 25 slept. They were believers. How could this happen? We're believers, right? Are we asleep? So be wary of those whose message is one of peace and safety because we realize from Scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, where it states, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Mrs. White adds clarity on the matter, writing in a periodical Bible echo on May 4, 1896, in paragraph 2, it says the following, Here in a world lying in wickedness, in deception and delusion, in the very shadow of death, asleep. And she repeats, asleep. Who are feeling travail of soul to awaken them? Who will put the call out? What voice can reach them? My mind is carried to the future when the, s the signal will be given. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him, but some will have delayed to obtain oil for replenishing their lamps. And too late, they will find. Pay attention here. We're familiar in Scripture that oil is associated with the Holy Spirit. But she goes on to give further understanding and clarity in this particular point. And too late they find that character which is represented by the oil is not transferable. The oil is the righteousness of Christ. It represents character, and the character is not transferable. No man can secure it for another. Each must obtain for himself a character purified from every stain of sin. The Lord is coming in power and great glory. It will then be His work to make a complete separation between the righteous and the wicked. But the oil cannot then be transferred to vessels of those who have it not. Then shall be fulfilled the words of Christ. Two women will be grinding together. One shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. The righteous and the wicked are to be associated together in the work of life. But the Lord reads the character. He discerns who are his 
obedient children who respect and love His commandments. Time is of the essence, people. Do not be overwhelmed by the thought that somehow we are going to manage this in and of ourselves. We cannot. We will not. But we can rest assured that if we if we will go daily sometimes it may even seem moment by moment. Go to the throne room. Go on your knees. Go to the Lord in prayer. We do not pray near enough. We need to be much more serious. in our seeking the Lord while he may be found. The Lord calls out to us today. Keep justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come, and my righteousness is to be revealed. Blessed is the man or woman who does this, and the son of man who lays hold of it who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and who keeps his hand from doing any evil. Again, I'll say it again. We cannot do this in our own strength, but God is faithful. He will wake, work it out in his people. He's calling out a remnant. We have choice. God continues. We have liberty of conscience. He will not withhold. But people, we must know that we don't have that much time to exercise the kind of relationship that we'll need to stand in the days ahead for those that God will cause to stand. And we must remember none of us is promised tomorrow. I know this is not the first time that I've shared this conviction with you, and it's not my conviction, but it is a conviction of mine. It's scriptural. And perhaps somewhere deep inside you, perhaps you're beginning to realize. Please open to our last text for this morning. And it comes from the book of Jude. Short one, but it is a capstone scripture and a promise that we can cling to. We must not forget. Jude, verses 20 through 25. But you, dear friends, By building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you, to bring you into eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Now, 
to him who is able, it bears repeating, to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. When you seek God in your prayer closet, closet, ask Him for spiritual eyes to discern the times. No, we do not know the day nor the hour, but we can know the season. May God give us the wisdom, the discernment that is needed, not just for this day, but for all the days that He gives us as He takes us on this journey, on the straight path that leads through the narrow gate, the only gate that goes home to him.